meeting of City Council for Monday, March 13th to order. Um, our first order of business is two delegations. Uh, 2.1, we have Miss Glenda Farndon, uh, Senior Municipal Relations Liaison, and Mr. John Gogan, uh, Provincial Director for Northern and Central Alberta Operations for star with STARS in attendance uh, for the annual STARS update to Council. So uh, welcome, both of you, and uh, Thank you. you're welcome. You just got to push the button on the mic when you sit down there. John, or if you could just push the button on the mic there, and then I will turn it on. Um, yeah, perfect. So, there. so welcome. We're uh, you know we're excited to to have you here today, and uh, Stars is such a an an amazing uh, program, an important part for for our area. So it's uh, excited about listening to this. So thank you. Well, we're very pleased to bring you your annual update, and we um, want to for first first and foremost like. Uh, Thank you for your continued partnership. Uh, you've been part of the Peace River Regional District Partnership that supported STARS since we brought a base to, to Grand Prairie, and uh, we're on 16 years now in partnership, so thank you for that. So we'll start in the beginning here with the first that I'd like to draw your attention to after 37 years of serving residents that we are now uh, going through a bit of a rebrand. So you'll see just a little bit different logo there. As well, you know, STARS has always been about saving lives, and now we are furthering that vision that to provide critical care anywhere. Next slide, please. So, of course, STARS is fueled by generosity, and you've been a significant part of that. Uh, last year, Alberta Health Services did suggest or did um, announce that in the early part of the year that they would be looking to provide. 50% government funding. We have previously had a 10-year affiliation agreement through 2020 at 20% government funding. During the COVID years, it's been year to year, and so I'm pleased to announce that at the end of last year, we did receive the top-up, so we they did provide 50% government funding for STARS. We're currently in negotiations as we speak to hopefully secure another long-term affiliation agreement. So more um, to come at a future update. In the meantime, on the expenditure side, um, you can see from the orange and the blue that uh, th more than three quarters of all expenditures are aviation and medically related. So that's an important factor as well. The smaller piece is our STARS Emergency Link Center at 6%. Now that is our dispatch center out of Calgary, as well as 12% for operation and administration costs. This is our fourth year that we've remained at 12%. I think it's key to know that um, CRA allows up to 35% for charitable entities for, for administration costs. And we are at our fourth year at 12%. So we're very proud of that fact, and we feel that we are doing our due diligence in this area. Next. This gives you an idea. Everything that you see green here across Alberta and into northeastern BC, the Peace River Regional District, are all municipal supporters of STARS annually to help support STARS operations. So more than 90% of Alberta has now joined in regional partnerships. We've just added four new rural municipalities in Alberta, as well as four urbans. So urbans and rural together are supporting STARS either on a fixed rate or a per capita amount. We thank the city of Dawson Creek as well. You're part of the Peace River Regional District multi-year um, grant. And so you've just renewed another three-year grant to support STARS operations that serve your residents and area. So we thank you for that. You are part of the united municipal effort that ensures that we all have access to a robust health and safety network. Currently, we're generating just over $2 million per year in municipal sustainable support for STARS. And you are also, as Peace River Regional District, one of our municipal leaders. So we're very proud to have your logo on the helicopter as well, showing that you are a municipal leader and have been for many years. Um, 
We are very much looking forward to two, adding two more municipalities that will also receive local recognition in the spring for Sturgeon County as well as Birch Hills County. John. Uh, good morning and thank you for having us again. So in the last 12 years, uh, we've been into your community and area about 200 times. Uh, I think one of the things I'd like you just to take note is back in 2018, many of you in the room might have been help or might have helped us in creating a better partnership with BC Health. Our call volume had dropped significantly. Uh, we leaned on the Peace River, Peace River Regional District uh, quite a bit to start to engage some dialogue with government. And in late 2018, we began a new partnership with both the Kamloops Dispatch as well as BC Health. And you can see an upward trend uh, creeping up all the way to 71 here for a total. Uh, I just wanted to pass on a sincere thanks. We could not have made those partnerships and made those connections without the support of this area. And I sit on a quarterly meeting with BC uh, Dispatch out of... Uh, out of uh, Kamloops each uh, each quarter, and we're in constant contact with the doctors, many of which used to be Stars Transport physicians. So I just wanted to thank you for that. So very excited to bring you this particular piece of information. Let's look on the left hand side first. So we had the opportunity to u utilize data only back to 2010. No patient information, only the postal code of where they lived at the time they were flown by STARS. So this gives you some information. Again, please keep in mind that this is only including patients that we did have their postal code. There are many others that we did not have a postal code, so they could not be included in this particular uh, data. So these residents, 69 in total since 2010, that live with the, lie within the Peace River Regional District boundaries have a postal code within. So for Dawson Creek specifically, 31 residents have been flown by STARS since 2010 um, with a Dawson Creek postal code. But more importantly, let's look on the right-hand side. The red dots represent the locations where these residents would have traveled and needed STARS. This is the important factor of the importance of our partnership. And a testament to our partnership, Peace River Regional District residents have been served by all three bases in across Alberta, across two provinces, but more importantly, all of your residents have access to STARS across Western Canada from our six bases. That is the partnership. We are together ensuring that we all have access to robust health and safety network. Next slide, please. I am a pilot, so my wife will, will tell me to keep this one short. Uh, I don't want to talk a lot about the new aircraft, but put simply, we're getting better, uh, certainly better speed than we thought out of the aircraft. The extra 35 minutes of fuel has been invaluable for our organization. And from a safety standpoint, the cockpit up front, the autopilot, the synthetic vision allows us to fly through the mountains without actually even be, being able to see anything. And the ability to upgrade the computer and the software on board this aircraft, both in the front and in the back, Linda will talk to the back, uh, has been a real game changer for our organization. Uh, yeah, and Glenda always wants me to mention, uh, back in 2002, STARS was the first civilian organization in North America to be able to receive night vision goggles in a post-9-11 world, and we continue to use them both to come to your community and to British Columbia and across all six of our bases in Western Canada. These new helicopters allow you to fly at nighttime? Yeah, too, always yeah. at night, uh, but they have a synthetic package in the heads-up display that allows us to see things uh, that are put in, generated into a computer program that we wouldn't be able to see otherwise. Yeah, really quite fascinating. So in our link center, um, we average about 99 calls per day. This is Mr. Griffiths, my director counterpart down there. What the link center does, and we have some great examples here in the Dawson area, is they connect everybody that needs to know in a timely fashion all at once. So we can have up to 50 people on one phone call at the same time. So everybody gets the story, both the hospital here, EMS providers, physicians, physicians in Edmonton or Grand Prairie where the patients are going, sometimes even the patient's family. They're able to connect us with all of our partners in the Ally Health System to make sure that we get the most timely support and the most uh, appropriate location to bring these patients. Uh, Dawson Creek being, uh, we can, might have at time at the end to tell you about a very interesting call that happened before Christmas. One of the big partnerships as well, and I thanked you before, is this partnership we now have with Kamloops. <clears throat> For any calls that are in this area, 
the BC Healthcare System is now activating STARS Transport Physicians, our air medical crew, through the Link Center for any interfacility call and frequently for seeing calls in this region. And that's in large part thanks to many of you in the room. So, you know, we have these wonderful new helicopters to take us into the future for generations to come, but it's also important about the back of the helicopter and the fact that the H145s have an intensive care unit environment. And so I just wanted to give you just a little bit of an insight into some of the specialized equipment, starting with the handheld iStat Lab. You can see that it's the size of a cell phone, but it, more importantly, it provides vital test results for hemoglobin, blood gases, even electrolytes, with only a couple of drops of blood in less than two minutes. Very important when we're managing multiple pain management drugs for a, a trauma patient. The Hamilton T1 ventilator is fully featured, just like what you'd find in the intensive care units in the hospital, but it's especially made for transport systems. And better yet, it accommodates all sizes of patients, adult, pediatric, even neonatal. We always carry two units of universal blood on board. STARS was the very first helicopter EMS program in North America to bring this life-saving measure on board, and it has been truly the difference between life and death for many patients. The video laryngoscope. Now, this is an advancement in intubation. You can see that our crews can actually view the trachea on screen while intubating the patient. Very important when you're managing difficult airways for like a trauma patient, maybe a burn patient or someone that's been crushed on impact and a patient that can no longer breathe for themselves. The easy IO drill. So now this is only used in very time-sensitive, life-threatening cases, but you'd be surprised how many times we do have to utilize this piece of equipment. It allows us to have immediate IV access through the bone to provide stabilization and pain management, especially for trauma patients. The handheld ultrasound. Now this provides test results for the rapid diagnosis of collapsed lungs, internal bleeding, heart abnormalities, even fetal compromise in ill or injured pregnant mothers. And now the way the new helicopters are equipped with integrated Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and satellite connectivity, it allows us to actually transmit in real time the test results to the receiving doctors at the receiving hospital so they'll know what they are dealing with when the patient is incoming and be able to expedite their treatment plans for that patient. We carry a plethora of pain management drugs as well as the thrombolytics for a query stroke patient. We do have agreements with all of the hospitals in re across Western Canada that are on the stroke protocol so that we can contact them and let them know that we are en route with the query stroke patient, get that patient into the CAT scanner in order to identify if it is indeed the type of stroke that warrants the thrombolytic drugs. And of course, with specialized equipment in that intensive care unit environment also means that you need to have the very highest level of clinical critical care expertise. So we are very, very proud of the fact this was October of the end of October last year that at the Air Medical Transport Conference, which is a worldwide conference and competition. And so STARS, we've been participating for 20 years now. STARS always holds our own internal competition to allow only one team of two across all bases to have the honor to represent STARS internationally at this competition. STARS crew have placed in the 20 years, in the top three, all 20 years, worldwide, as well as we our crew from Saskatoon this last year took first place, and this marks the seventh year in those 20 years that STARS has also been first place. We very much feel that, you know, we're proud that we're bringing the highest level of critical care available to your residents. So in closing, I would just like to say thank you again. Thank you very much to the city of Dawson Creek and your residents for your partnership. We thank you for your leadership. We thank you for your dedication to STARS and, of course, for your ongoing support. A life is saved every day, and it's partnership that makes that possible. 
So thank you for your partnership. Perfect. Thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, yeah, just amazing to see it in what, uh, what STARS does as a whole. Um, just before I open this to council um, for questions, could, could you just give me a little bit of update? I, um, I was able to sit in on one of these before presentations from you. And um, could you let us know about the um, individual that you helped, that STARS helped in Dawson Creek recently? I think that was... Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So just before Christmas, we had an individual that was critically injured and uh, in hospital here locally. It initially it sounded like there was going to be a significant delay with BC assets, BC aircraft getting out of Vancouver, and our transport physician, uh, who was actually at the Grand Prairie base that evening, uh, stepped up and said, "You know, we just need we need to continue this partnership. The time frames that we're looking at, because of again, the assets coming out of British Columbia." Uh, being used elsewhere just weren't appropriate. And instead of an eight-hour wait, uh, we not only uh, supported the local uh, health alliance here to get them stabilized, but uh, opted to to go directly to Edmonton. So we ended up taking our crew from here, met up with an Alberta Health Services fix wing in Grand Prairie that was coming off another call, and then our crew subsequently um, escorted the patient with critical care all the way to the Edmonton Hospital. And again, it, it's partnerships, as Glenda mentioned, that it's not that we're trying to take over the system, it's that we're there as an, as an adjunct to an already great system here in BC. And, and again, if we go back to 2018, these partnerships just would not be where they are had we not had you know, the influence of council and, and the region uh, to be able to create those connections. Yeah, that was the bear attack, the bear attack victim, yeah. Yep. So, um, If you would allow I'd like, John, to just give you a little bit of insight on with the transport physicians now being in the emergency link center and our virtual care as well to assist your local personnel. Yeah, so if you've seen the new STARS commercial, you'll see this shot where the transport physician is talking and then all of a sudden they're on an iPad. Recently, we've started a program out of the United Kingdom called Good Sam. It's been around for 10 years in, the, in, in Europe. And because of the Wi-Fi in the back of the aircraft, what we're now allowed, what we're now able to do is our air medical crew is providing critical care. All of the equipment in the back of the helicopter through the Wi-Fi system gets transferred directly to the link center and to our STARS transport physician. And then through an app, we're able to securely connect to a rural hospital and talk to their transport to talk to their doctors and nurses in real time, and everybody is able to see the patient's information in real time. So when the hospital calls here, fixed wing out of BC or partnerships here in BC or stars may not be able to get there for 40 or 45 minutes, but now you will have real time transport live, like FaceTime, essentially in the time that you're waiting. And it's that waiting time. Like, what do you do in the meantime? So our transport physicians have been doing this on a trial, and now we're actually spreading into all Alberta hospitals, and the next phase of that will be British Columbia Hospital. So it's pretty fascinating to have that, you know, that urban help with you in a time of need. It's been a pretty amazing program, and it will continue to grow. Awesome. Thank you. Councillor Parslow. I guess I'll turn your mic on, too. <laughs> So thank you for your impressive presentation. Um, I've always been impressed with STARS, and even more so as a result of this presentation, that how you're keeping current and bringing the very best of technology to the area. You talked about rebranding. I really like, to, to restate your, that slow, slogan, if I can call it that? Oh, that, uh, well, originally, you know, as saying we've always been about saving lives. Yes. But now we are strengthening that vision to bring critical care anywhere. So would that, so that's, that, I like that, right? Critical care anywhere. So it's virtually. So, yeah. Obviously through the app. Yeah. Um, the helicopter is a great tool, but we've recognized in the last many years that it's not always the correct tool. So we've started to partner with Alberta Health Services. So when the helicopter can't fly and it's appropriate, our teams are now going by fixed wing and we're moving into a ground response trial. We have one in Edmonton where if the helicopter can't fly and it's very, it's within an hour drive of the base, again, instead of having the top 3% of pre-hospital mm -hmm. care sitting on the couch wishing that they could go to a rural hospital, they're now going by ground, and the next evolution of that starting after June is going to be in Grand Prairie and then followed by Calgary. So it's providing critical care in any way we can, in any fashion we can, using the technology that's out there for us. Yeah, no, I like, I like the slogan. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate yeah. that. We'll pass that on. Thank you very much. 
Uh, Councillor Apollonio. Good morning. Yeah, uh, as I heard, uh, you're the key people that say, especially from my fellow men from the Philippines, that you're the better tax that, right? I think we thank everyone in the city for helping those two individuals to be to have their lives back together. And I think you're the last person that we we are, or personally, I'm going to say thank you for saving them. They are. Yeah, they're thriving now. They're going back to their normal lives. So yes. thank you very much, Star. So yeah, uh, I'm, going, I'm getting goosebumps right oh, now. Yeah. We know yeah. her injuries were very serious. Yeah, I know. Thank you very much. In behalf of them, and of course, in behalf of my community, the Filipino community, and of course, in, in, of entire Dawson Creek. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, any, anybody else have any questions? Councillor Earl. Uh, thank you, Worship. Just with respect to some of the statistics you provided, um, it would appear that Dawson Creek is um, overrepresented in the region as part of the transports out compared to, say, Fort St. John, which is a, a larger municipal center. Is that just um, the result of our proximity to Alberta or just because they're more active in the interfacility transfers? Or how would you explain that? It's a great question. It's probably a combination of, of many factors, to be honest with you. I would say that proximity is probably our best guess. Um, you know, we do have a very strong relationship both with fire and EMS in this region. There are, because of the extra flight time to Fort St. John and the little larger center, um, we may not always be front of mind for BC Health just because of the extra flight time. Um, but again, uh, our STARS Emergency Link Center basically takes in about 30,000 calls per year and several thousand of those are from British Columbia. So it's, if it's deemed that we are the right tool with the right tools in the back for that community, then we'll go. But I'd say that the proximity of your community to the Grand Prairie base is probably first and foremost. Okay, and above and beyond um, the agreement with the Peace River uh, Regional District, um, you've mentioned BC Health. Is the, the BC government providing any kind of base funding in the way that Alberta Health is as well? Yeah, they they cover our hourly cost. We haven't agreed upon. But there's it, no baseline stipend for you. There's no baseline, here. only for calls that we complete. Okay, hey, that's good to know. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Earl. Any other questions? No. I had a couple. I just um, at the beginning of your presentation, um, you said that the Alberta government was funding was twenty percent, and now it's up to fifty. Uh, that you're working for. So I guess if moving forward, if it is 50%, is that, you know, there's obviously going to be a surplus. Um, from the other side, is, is there a vision to grow STARS further, like into BC or like add more mm -hmm. units? Is there, like, where, what's the the future look like if that happens? Yeah, I, I think the future is bright. I'm fortunate enough in, in my role that we're receiving calls from right across North America and the world every week about what it is that we provide. We did look very seriously at the tendered contract for British Columbia for the nine new bases. Um, what I can say about that is we are a critical care nurse, critical care medic team, and um, it was felt that that might not be the right fit um, by the people that were tendering the contract. And uh, we're just watching carefully what happens to that contract. Um, we're always looking for opportunities to support and uh, and and bring critical care to the masses. We're talking with Treaty 8 right now, talking with Treaty 10. We're in contact with negotiations uh, in the high Arctic just with reference to the virtual care, just to bring support to them in the meantime. And yeah, if any opportunity came through the door, we seriously look at it and we're always looking at expansion if it's appropriate for our organization for us to help with awesome. our model, I, can, I should add. Yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you. I mean, it's um, the first time I got to go through this presentation. I was, you know, I've seen stars a lot in my time being up here. Um, but it's just, it's so amazing to see what you actually do and, you know, the passion and how innovative you are, um, stars is as a whole and moving forward. So, um, yeah, I just want to thank you for, you know, for everything you do. And uh, I'm glad we can be part of, um, you know, the help of it. And, uh, yeah, I also wanted to thank you for, uh, bearing the weather and driving um, up this morning and uh, it's our pleasure yeah so thank you very much thank you uh, we did bring you your annual um, impact report that kind of highlights the different areas where you are also you know your support is supporting stars in many different areas um, brought you a calendar new calendar so has great patient stories as well but I would like to draw your attention to the latest um, newsletter so on the back 
is a very interesting story in the fact that STARS in 37 years flew its very recently its record mission in 37 years, and it was for a patient from Peace River Regional District. So they said that this, if we, you were to fly the total distance of this mission in a straight line, it would be like flying from Calgary to Los Angeles. It's a very interesting story that I hope that you'll take share. Wow, awesome. Thank you very much. So, thank you, thank you thank again for yeah, your you're time. Welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Leave this here for the next presenter. Thanks, John and Glenda. <laughs> Thank you. Um, safe travels. Oh, are you? <laughs> See you. Um, all right, our next order of business uh, is 2.2. We have Mr. Grady McTavish, writer, director, and producer, and Mr. Ryan Leewood, producer and director of photography, Macwood Productions in attendance, uh, regarding the request for funding up to $7,000 to produce a hard reset. So, so welcome. We'll turn thank you. that on. Thank there. you very much. Uh, thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it. Um, as uh, Mayor Dover uh, said, I'm Gertie McTavish. I'm Ryan Leewood. And together we are Macwood Productions. Um, McTavish and Leewood together, both symbolically and literally. Uh, today we are going to present a funding proposal for the Dawson Creek feature film, Hard Reset. Um, Macwood Productions is composed of Grady and I, as he mentioned. Uh, we are local award-winning filmmakers with great smiles. Whoever has the better smile is still up for debate. What is not up for debate, however, is the fact that we've made 50 short films and 11 commercials locally. And we own a wide variety of our own film and sound equipment, which means we don't have to procure any fresh equipment to make the film or do any rentals. I also have a certificate in film uh, producing and directing from Langara College in Vancouver. Uh, but it is not just us. As the great Orson Welles said, a writer needs a pen, an artist needs a brush, but a filmmaker needs an army. And thankfully, we have already started to assemble our army. Uh, we have a few pictures missing, so apologies for that. Um, but... First and foremost, our lead actor is Aaron Tremblay. Aaron is a prominent member here in the theater community in Dawson Creek. He is also a very uh, uh, accomplished musician. He is now taking his talents to the big screen. Next up, we have Mr. Taylor Leewood, who is uh, Mr. Ryan Leewood's brother, but don't hold that against him. He's uh, going to be recording sound for us uh, to make sure our sound for the film is crisp, clear, and professional. Next on the docket, we have Derek Akira Zakai, who is a Vancouver-based music composer and has composed music for countless short films and is now dipping his toes into feature films as well. And last but not least, we have Dawson Creek local Lizzie McLean doing special effects, production design, and camera work. Lizzie is a recent high school graduate who is uh, very talented in uh, numerous areas and I would highly recommend watching out for her in the future because she might be very famous. So what is Hard Reset all about and uh, what makes it stand out? Well, the key to engaging your audience uh, and making any film great is the story. What the story is about and how it is told um, will make or break your film. Thankfully, we have a great one. Meet high school principal Phil Danielson, played by Aaron Tremblay. Uh, Phil Danielson is the Dawson Creek equivalent of Mr. Rogers, a wholesome and well-loved member of Dawson Creek, but Phil Danielson has a dark secret. His hard reset where Phil travels to a remote location to engage in an unhinged night of partying. A documentary film director discovers this and forces Phil to show him his secret life, causing both the documentary and Phil's life to spiral out of control. Uh, the, the film features both comedy and drama, uh, dealing with important themes such as repression, hedonism, and the predatory nature of media. No offense. Um, it will feature drug use, alcohol abuse, and hints of sexual relations throughout the film. Uh, but all of these issues will be portrayed in non-exploitive and... Uh, non-salacious. Uh, yeah, non-salacious ways and are key to the story that we're telling. In addition to this, uh, multiple uh, Dawson Creek locations will feature prominently in the film. This would include um, KPAC, Northern Lights College, downtown Dawson Creek, and of course, the famous Dawson Creek windmills, all will feature, prominent, excuse me, all will feature prominently in the motion picture. 
Our total, oh, sorry. Our total budget equals $7,000 with the majority of the funds being put towards food and labor to make sure our cast and crew is compensated appropriately for their time. Uh, please take a look at our budget top sheet for more information. I also have a handout in case anyone would like to take a look. Um, for contributions and investments, we're seeking uh, up to $7,000 and we plan to recuperate 125% of the funds contributed. Um, we project we can make upwards of $5,000 based on previous acquisitions through um, Netflix for films of similar genres. Mm -hmm. yep. Our business plan follows three steps. Distribution locally, distribution domestically, and distribution online. Taking a look at distribution locally first, we plan to hold pre-screenings in Dawson Creek in late September, first being at KPAC and the other two being at Center Cinema. Uh, we project to have 80 attendees at the minimum. This is based off of our previous event at the Macwood Horror Fest from October, where we had 65 paying attendees. This increase uh, would be due to proper marketing with our connections at CJDC <coughs> and The Mirror, Rob Brown. Um, after which... Um, if we're breaking down the costs here, we project to make $640 at the first KPAC screening. After which, for the first Center Cinema screening, we plan to, excuse me, we project to make a profit of $1,600. And at the third and final screening, we uh, expect a slight drop off in attendance to 40 attendees for a total of $800. This brings us to a projected total of $3,000. Now on to distribution domestically. After our screenings, we plan to submit the film to both well-known and regional film festivals across Canada and the United States. If we are accepted, we plan to uh, connect with distributors there and attempt to make a sale for the film. Uh, based off of previous acquisitions of other Canadian independent films by streaming services such as Netflix, we can project to possibly sell the film for $5,000. Of course, I do wanna highlight uh, that this is a massive risk as thousands of films are submitted and rejected by film festivals on a yearly basis, so uh, we do have to keep that in mind. Um, we will also be distributing the film online uh, through video on demand services such as iTunes, Amazon Prime, Vimeo Pro, and our own pro pro proprietary streaming service that we have hosted on our website. Um, for the best and worst case scenarios, we'll assume a 70%, 30% split between rentals and purchases uh, at $7 and $25 respectively, um, and all are adjusted for overhead. Um, but in the worst case scenario, uh, we'd be looking at like a minimal engagement of say 75 people per week. Um, uh, but we may see revenue uh, as low as $2,800, um, I think in the first year or something through uh, video on demand. Um, with proper marketing, however, we could potentially reach 2,500 people per week, um, and at just 10% engagement with the aforementioned split, we could see revenue up to $9,150. Um, the $4,000 mentioned in the presentation is kind of a, um, a tentative low end with moderate marketing. Jumping over to our proposed schedule. I'm sorry, I keep speaking too loud. Um, our first shoot date would be May 13th, 2023, continuing on to July 9th, 2023, for a total shoot days of 18. Uh, we'd be shooting only on Saturdays and Sundays. This would be the most cost, excuse me, the most cost effective way and works for the scheduling of our cast and crew who are also working full time jobs. We would start editing August 1st, 2023, finishing up editing on August 29th. From August 29th to September 23rd, uh, color, music, and sound design uh, will be worked on and finished. The 23rd <clears throat> to um, the 25th, there would be our screening dates, the 23rd being KPAC and the 24th, 25th being Center Cinema. October 1st, 2023, following the screenings, we would submit to both uh, well-known and regional film festivals from there. So we've got the schedule, we've got a great cast and crew, uh, we have a tremendous uh, script, but Grady, how does this affect taxpayers? Well, Ryan, uh, it positively affects taxpayers in Dawson Creek and helps the community as a whole because we want to grow a film industry here in Dawson Creek. Our mission statement aligns with the cities when we want to celebrate our arts, heritage, and culture here in Dawson Creek. We want to make Dawson Creek the filmmaking capital of Northern BC. We want to make award-winning local feature films starring local talent made by local talent about stories here in Dawson. 
We also want to give local up-and-coming Dawson Creek filmmakers the opportunities to make their own films without the need of moving to Vancouver or Toronto to do so. By investing, uh, you help facilitate and grow the Dawson Creek film industry and begin to build an even greater arts community. Not only are we bringing on local artists for our own film, but it will show other local filmmakers that there are opportunities in Dawson to make their own art, and it'll encourage them to do the same. Like the city, we want to focus and promote opportunities for economic development inherent in our community here in Dawson Creek. Coming from a personal story, um, I'm born and raised in Dawson Creek, and um, I obviously graduated here. Uh, unfortunately, there was uh, uh, no uh, opportunities for education or honing my craft and filmmaking here, so I had to move down to Vancouver. And of course, that was an exceptional experience, and um, I greatly enjoyed that. But a lot of uh, young people, especially, don't have that opportunity, and we would love to provide that opportunity here in Dawson Creek. We are already starting to do that with the uh, Macwood Crash Course in Filmmaking that we're currently putting on at KPAC. Um, but this would allow us to um, continue that and, and move forward. With Macwood Productions and City Council, we can start the Dawson Creek film industry. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Grady and Ryan. Um, very well um, put together presentation, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll open this up to uh, if there's any questions from Council. Councillor Parslow. Well, my, my initial response is uh, I like it. Um, I appreciate your reference in the city's guiding principles. Thank you. And um, it's always uh, in my heart, right, that we, uh, mm -hmm. we live those things. Yes. I've been a, an artist myself. Um, I've always uh, been concerned about this applies across the country. Yes. <laughs> uh, the imbalance between the funds spent per capita on sports and funds spent per capita on the arts. Mm -hmm. There's a real imbalance. So, yeah. um, and I really like uh, your reference to economic development because, um, you know, a lot of... Uh, a lot of things happen that generates economic activity, but it really lines the pockets of people who don't live here. Yeah. And uh, this is uh, enabling some of our local residents who um, have a, a love of the arts to, to do things here. And um, mm -hmm. why not? Why can't Dawson Creek be a recognized film center? Yeah. And so I like that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Parzal. Councillor Earl. Uh, thank you, Worship, and thank you both. That was a, a very good presentation, and thank you. I applaud your enterprise, and I was uh, watching through some of the, the links you provided, mm -hmm. and um, I, I appreciate what you do. Um, are you uh, securing funding through the umbrella of, like, a nonprofit or anything? Just because uh, I'm thinking as a municipal government, Mm -hmm. um, if we were inclined, if council were inclined to provide some sort of funding for something like this, to give money to a uh, company, essentially, mm -hmm. for what is uh, an investment. It's not generally something we, as a municipal government, would do. So is there a non-profit entity um, that you can secure these kind of uh, agreements if you're going to, to government for for funding in the region uh, through an arts council or what have you? Um, at this time, we currently are not affiliated with a uh, nonprofit. Okay. Um, we do have um, <clears throat> connections to nonprofits where we could um, attempt to uh, make a partnership, absolutely. Okay. Um, and are you at all familiar with the entity Creative BC? Yes, yeah. okay. yes, Because yes. they're one of the few, um, they're a nonprofit that is funded by the provincial government, but they are one of the few recognizing how uh, recreation and cultural culture and arts work. Uh, they will provide funding for a private company to mm -hmm. to do production, what be it music or film or what have you. Gotcha. Um, but I, I I appreciate the presentation. Um, I guess we'll see what what council's discussion goes towards. But yeah, one my main apprehension would be. Um, funding, uh, uh, providing funding to a private business, and that's not generally something we've done in the past. Um, mm -hmm. Never say never, but yeah, of course, that's where the hangout might be. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Earl. Any other questions? Oh, Councillor Apollonio. 
Thank you, Worship. Uh, thank you very much for coming and nice presentation. Thank you. Actually, I saw the passion in your eyes <laughs> during <laughs> this. Actually, I was watching the Oscars last yesterday, last night. And yes. Of course, I would like to see some dozen Greek people to be up there maybe soon. <laughs> but as, yes. I, as I said, uh, do you have any production before? Like, I'm not sorry, my ignorance. Uh, you have like films produced before, like that mm -hmm. we can see or we can watch, like online or something. Yeah, of course, we have a YouTube channel um, called Macwood Productions. Uh, there, we post um, um, our main bread and butter for content is short films. So we do uh, monthly short films there. We have about, I'd say, thirty of them on there. Um, in addition to that, we also uh, uh, do reviews and other pieces of content. But yeah, our main bread and butter short films are up on our YouTube channel, uh, Macwood Productions. Yeah. So basically you're doing it like, uh, aside from your passion, of course. Yes, yes. Yeah. We don't, um, at this time, we don't make money off short films. It's, okay. it's just because we're passion for it. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Apolonio. Um, Councillor Parslow. Yes, just bear with me this second. Uh, I really appreciate Councillor Earl's uh, comments. Uh, mm -hmm. And staff, uh, just jump in if I make an inaccurate statement here. You know, we, there is a difficulty under the community charter, right, mm -hmm. for supporting um, a private business. Uh, if we do it for one, we must do whatever we do for all. Of course. Um, and I think that is what my colleague is referring to. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you you guys are obviously creative people. There, there, there are ways um, around that if you get into a partnership with a non-profit entity, such okay. as the South Peace Cultural Society. Right, okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good point that uh, Councillor Earl raised. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Parzal. Any other questions? No? Um, I, again, I want to thank you, Grady and Ryan, for coming in. And I know I had the, the chance to meet with uh, Grady before. And, you know, everything, your presentation and all your documentation to us was well put together. So I want to thank, thank you. you for that. And, you know, it's clear to see um, the passion that you both have for this. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that makes it exciting. So um, the next steps in this is it comes back under... Uh, mayor's business later on and mm. um, council will talk about it and you know make a decision uh, on your ask um perfect and then we, we'll let you know where it goes from there and and then just to be clear i, I guess your ask is you're asking up to seven thousand dollars yes to, okay. up to seven thousand yeah. dollars yeah okay perfect well thank you very much for coming in and uh, yeah. thank you so much really appreciate your guys' time okay, thank you welcome. thank you thank you so much um all right, our next order of business is three late items. Um, I don't think there is any late items, no. Uh, next, four new councillor business, uh, 4.1, council liaison report from Councillor Earl uh, regarding the Kiwanis Performing Arts Centre. Um, so just bef before you give your update, I just wanted to, to thank you for submitting that report. It's um, perfectly lined out and uh, gives that information to, to all of council to review, so thank you. Uh, no. you're, you're welcome, Your Worship. Um, yeah, I uh, tried to keep it brief. Um, not much to add other than to, uh, once again, congratulate the Kiwanis Performing Arts Centre, the Calvin Crook Centre, and uh, for a clean audit. It's, it was, uh, the, the period covered was kind of uh, during uh, a large segment of the pandemic, so it was obviously, like most arts and recreation and, and public assembly venues, a very, very challenging time for them, but they've managed to uh, weather the storm and they are currently um, recovering and, and building back stronger and I'd congratulate them on a clean audit. Uh, to my fellow councillors, I, I have provided the information, finances and annual general report. If you'd like to have a look at that, uh, you can ask city staff. And I would welcome the new and returning board members who, who've uh, stepped forward to serve for the next year. Um, uh, Michelle Mobley, Jivin Bobin, Luke Gleason, Tree Wynn, Heather Kohler, and Dory Braun. Um, and myself and, and um, John Vetter also serves as their liaison for the Kiwanis Club. So, um, yep, looking forward to uh, the next year. 
Um, and one more item, I didn't do up a report for this, but I wanted to mention it, Your Worship. I, you asked me, or I had the opportunity to attend uh, on the city's behalf, the just before preschool official opening at Tremblay earlier this month. It is a pilot program being funded by the newly minted Ministry of Education and Child Care. Um, provides, at this point, uh, 10 spaces for uh, pre-K in uh, Tremblay. I think they're looking to grow that to 20 if they can, um, and they, they're fully subscribed. So I had an opportunity to welcome the inaugural class of uh, four-year-olds, and they were they found my speech on the budget riveting. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I'd just like to uh, congratulate the, the folks at School District 59 and uh, Gloria Cleave and the uh, program uh, facilitator Gabby for for their work and thank them for that. Uh, child care in the city is is very welcome. As somebody who just passed through the pre K phase of parenthood, um, there's no panic quite like the panic of not having reliable uh, child care. So uh, kudos to them. Thank you, Councillor L, for both those. Any other new councillor business? Councillor Kemp. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just wanted to mention that last month I did attend a two-day conference in Grand Prairie. Um, it was the Growing of the North Conference. Um, it was really good to get out, actually, um, you know, after COVID, um, being able to network. And uh, the guest speakers they had there were amazing. Um, I learned a lot. It was a really, really good conference, and I'm thankful that I got to attend it. Awesome. Thank you, Councillor Kemp. Uh, Councillor Apollonio. Thank you, Your Worship. Just reporting on my side, uh, I attended the uh, Dawson Creek Public Library. Uh, I missed the AGM because there was some miscommunication at the time line. But anyway, uh, they reported. I think the they sent already the AGM or the about the public library to, to the street of Dawson Creek. And of course, uh, during the meeting, we already hired the social media officer, which is Miss Emily Morris. Uh, she will be handling the the of course the promotion. Uh, information about the public libraries to make it more accessible to the public. Second, I attended or participated in the multicultural at the KPAC uh, hosted by the Dawson uh, Lakeview Learning Center, of course, the, from my community, the Filipino community, performed some uh, folk dance or uh, from the country, which is we can perform some uh, in the future if you want to ask to, to do it for you. And of course, thirdly, uh, we are holding now our, you know, of course, our Olympics or our Sports Olympics in the community. Uh, we are bringing together, in spite of this kind of weather, uh, we're trying to get together in, in this public setting like sports event running from March 4 to April 8. So every weekend at the Central or South Peace. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Arponio. Um, any other new council business? Oh, okay. Uh, next, uh, we have five adoption of minutes, 5.1 uh, minutes of the budget consul public consultation held on February 21st, 2023 for adoption. Councillor Earl, second Councillor Kempf. We'll call the vote. Everybody in, Joe? Okay, vote is closed. Uh, it's carried. Uh, next, 5.2, we have minutes of the public consultation from February 27th, 2023 for adoption. Councillor Sudnick, second, Councillor Apollonio. I'll call that to vote. Vote is closed, uh, it's carried. Uh, next, 5.3 of minutes of the public hearing from February 27th, 2023 for adoption. Councillor Sudnick, Councillor McDonald, I'll call that to vote. Vote is closed. It's carried. Uh, next, 5.4, we have minutes of the regular council meeting with committee the whole uh, meeting on for on February 27th, 2023 for adoption. Councillor Sudnick, second Councillor Kemp. Call that to vote. Vote is closed. That's carried. Is there any business arising? Oh, all right. Uh, 
next we have uh, seven correspondence. 7.1, we have a letter from Angela Wilmot, Executive Director, South Peace Community Resource Society, regarding a uh, request for letter of support for application to the BC Hydro GoFund grant. Anybody like to answer Earl? Oh, oh sorry. Thank you. you. I will move that we provide the letter of support. Thank you. A second, Councillor Sudnick. Any discussion? Go ahead. Um, and I, I suppose this would probably be better directed to the organization in question, but one thing that did occur to me, if they're looking for a $1,000, one-time $10,000 grant to go towards staffing is... Yeah, generally, generally speaking... Um, one-time grants, $10,000 doesn't get you very far when you're looking to increase capacity. So I was just wondering how this, um, I, I mean, I support it and I trust their expertise. If the money can be useful to them, um, I fully accept that, but it might be worth getting some more insight into um, if that's going to be the, the way they quote it, uh, increase case planning and support for our residents um, through an increase in staffing. Um, just wondering how. $10,000 is going to be a drop in the bucket in my experience. So, um, But i I'm certainly uh, happy to support getting them some more resources. Just a question that occurred to me as I was reading through their letter. Thank you. Any other discussion? Um, Councillor Elser, I guess just to clarify, are you wanting staff to go ask that question? Because I, uh, you know, this letter to me is just a letter of support for a grant. No, I can I can reach out to Angela if 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 the follow follow ups required. I'm happy, and I'll I'll share that if I get anything. But that was just a question that occurred to me as I was reading it. But I'm happy to support it, and I, I certainly um, defer. You know if. If we can help them secure more funding for their programming, I'm all for it. Okay, thank you. All right, if there's no more discussion, I will call this motion to vote. Vote is closed. I think it was carried, right? Yes, okay. Uh, next, we have uh, eight reports. 8.1, we have report number 23-402 from the Development Service Manager uh, regarding the BC SPCA animal control budget increase for 2023. Councillor Earl. Thank you, Worship. I will move the recommendation that report number 23-042 from the Development Services Manager regarding BC SPCA Animal Control Budget Increase 2023 be received. Further, that Council approve an increase to the 2023 Draft 3 budget from $202,208 to $206,107 for animal control services for 2023. Further, that Council direct staff to enter into a one-year extension with the BCSPCA extending the current contract to May 31st, 2024. Further, that staff be directed to explore and provide long-term cost-effective options in regard to animal control and kenneling and bring recommendations back to a future Council meeting. Thank you, Councilor Earl. Do I have a second? Councilor McDonald. I would like to speak to that, Councilor Earl. Uh, other than to thank staff for, for going back a couple times, I think we've asked them to go back to the negotiating table, and this is, um, you know, <laughs> uh, this isn't uh, a solution, but it certainly gives us a year and some breathing room to figure out what the next steps are and what, um, you know, what services we require. Um, and yeah, uh, so thank you. Kudos to them. Thank you, Councillor. Any other discussion? Councillor Parslow. I'm concerned about the uh, cost of living um, amount, 6.8, uh, isn't it, somewhere in the report? I know it's referenced in the report. Um, you know, in a previous matter, councils decided that there was an excessive and uh, decided not to uh, apply that amount. I'm concerned that uh, if we 
we do it here, are we prepared to do it for other FPs, organizations or people we have contracts with to apply that um, highly inflationary amount to our, our budget? So, so I'm just, I mean, I'm pleased as well with as some of the sentiments that have been expressed already, but I am concerned about that, uh, that figure being used and just wonder about are there any implications in that for bargaining issues, uh, other agencies, and so on? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Parzo. I'll uh, let Kevin speak to this. I know um, there is some policies and contracts in place already that are already um, covered in this, but I'll let Kevin. So through your worship, um, as Councillor Earl indicated that, you know, this was a negotiation and we've been, we've been having conversations with the BC SBCA on this matter for some time now. And, and I think that's how staff would approach this is that, um, anyone that we're, we're, we're dealing with on these matters is, um, is going to be a negotiation. And so I, I don't feel that if we, or if council approves this with the indicated uh, CPI that's in the report, I, I don't believe that that's going to lock us in or, or set unnecessarily a precedent moving forward. I think each and every time that we um, have these sorts of situations in front of us, we'll be have to look at the uh, the current situation. And, and, and again, it's a negotiation. So um, I'm comfortable with, with that moving forward. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, any other discussion? No. Um, I just had one question. I'm just, uh, maybe it was not me doing, so we're moving this from two, 202 to 206, which is 4,000. So that's only like a 3% increase, but it, that's because it was originally 198. So is it from 198 to 206? Is that's the six the CPI? Through your worship. So yeah, originally it was 198 in 2022, so two percent on top of that was budgeted in 2023. So okay. now the difference is and in, in my the next report you'll see a calculation on how the 206, 107 is calculated. But yeah, it was it was increased originally two percent from 2022 to 2023. Okay. Thanks for clarifying, Terry. Um, and one other thing, too, is I, I want to thank staff as well for this, uh, just the back and forth, and also the SPCA. Uh, uh, I know they do a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of great things, and they gave us a great presentation. Um, I guess my one thing is, is, is if we put this off for a year, like I can only speak for myself, but I, I don't know, like, if it comes back in a year and we're going to, you know, propose another 20% increase for the next four years, like... Are we just going to leave this and deal with it like next April and then be kind of in the same position or because I, I think if moving forward, I, I really believe I know it says in here that we'll look at alternate um, things, but I, you know, I think it, there needs to be somewhat of a, a priority because to, to double that in four years, I still don't know if I could vote in favor of that if we're just prolonging that. So through your worship, I mean, Staff is clear that uh, based on coming back a couple of times to council, we, we understand their direction. And, yeah. and we don't believe that waiting a year and coming back with something that was opposed will, will likely be approved. So uh, our goal is to work on some alternatives uh, and explore what's out there. And we'll ultimately come back with what we believe is available to us as options. And the reality might be that there are some 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 good ones and more affordable ones, or there there may not be, and there may be this is the best best option. Then council will have to make a decision of whether we we continue with the with the service or not. But we will will try and lift every rock and look and see what's available to us. And is this something, Kevin? Like just so everybody understands, like when it's you know it, it will be next year before we deal with it again. But is it something like that you direct like staff start working on right away or how does that like the process of that work because it is a year down the road yeah so three worship we will have uh, obviously this ready for the budget deliberations that'll come this fall okay thank you all right um, any other discussion no i will call this motion to vote vote is closed it's carried 
Uh, I'm just going to call it 10 minute recess. So. Our regular council meeting for Monday, March 13th, back to order. Uh, our next order of business uh, was reports eight, uh, 8.2. We have report number 23-039 from the chief financial officer regarding the draft three 2023 budget report. Councillor McDonald. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to move the report number 23-039 from the Chief Financial Officer in regards to draft three of the 2023 budget report be received. And further, that Council approve draft three of the 2023 budget as presented. Thank you. Do I have a second? Councillor Apollonio. Any discussion? Councillor Parslow. There are, as you know, there are elements in this budget that I do not support, so I have great difficulty voting for this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Parslow. Uh, Councillor Earl. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, thank you, staff, and thank you to those few people who provided input at our budget consultation session. We'll see if we can't get it into double digits next year. Um, I, I, the one thing I, I do want to highlight to the public, uh, $697,276 in reclaimed water sales. This is the first year we're realizing that. I know I say it all the time, but it's just a really cool thing to see uh, an investment and a public-private partnership begin to pay dividends like this. Um, less potable water used for industry and revenue back to the city. Win-win-win um, all around. So. And otherwise, uh, thank you once again for the uh, the update and the reading material to staff. Thanks, Councillor Earl. Any other discussion? No. All right. I'd like to uh, also just um, reiterate what Councillor Earl said, and um, also thank you, Terry, and the team, um, Kevin at the the city, just for all the work that has went into this, and you know for everybody else that was involved in it as well. So thank you. Uh, if there's no other discussion, I'll call us to vote. Vote is closed and it's carried. Uh, one opposed, Councillor Parzel. Um, next, 8.3, we have report number 23-040 from the General Manager of Community Services regarding Parks, Recreation and Cultural Master Plan final report and next steps. Councillor Sudnick. I'll move the recommendation that report number 23-040 from the General Manager of Community Services regarding Parks, Recreation and Culture Master Plan. Final report and next steps be received. Further, that Council direct staff to use the attached Parks, Recreation and Culture Master Plan as a guiding document for the Community Services Department. Further, that Council approve the next seven steps outlined in the report. Thank you. Do I have a second? Councillor McDonald. Any discussion? Councillor Earl. Um, thank you, Worship. Just a question um, in, with respect to this recommendation, um, which uh, I do support moving, proving the next seven steps outlined in the report part. And, and but as we, um, <clears throat> is this going to be the final word on this report? Because I know <coughs> we've got further discussion around it and if, if if we pass this motion, it suggests to me that um, this is basically us putting our stamp of approval on the final report, and it, it's kind of a closed document moving forward for the next five years. And if, if that's the case, would it not make sense to wait until we've had our final discussion with the, um, as, as a group, collectively? Dante. Through your worship. So the report is the final report right now. <laughs> it's it's a live document, so it's going to be moving through the next 10 years. What's happening afterwards is workshops is moving us in the direction of the items that we need to move forward this year. So um, the workshop that we will be doing is to do with the allocation 
ICE user fees and equity and inclusion. And what we're doing with that workshop is just to figure out what your temperature is, where we're going with those policies as we move forward with the users. So this document is done as of now, but it is a moving document. It's going to be used for, to guiding, and if council is directing us to guide, that's what we'd like it to be able to guide and do the next seven steps as we move forward. And then next year, you guys will have um, a review of everything that has happened, and we continue on moving it for the next 10 years within this document. Thank you, Shante. Uh, any other discussion? Um, I had a couple of comments I mean, to Kevin or Shante. Um, you know, and this is, you know, not directed at anybody in a negative way. I'm just trying to think about it. But when in here, we talk about these seven policies and procedures that are going to, uh, we're going to have EDS group look at for $45,000. Um, I get there's seven, so it's, you know, hard to separate. I, I mean, I think there's some that probably need it. But when I look at this and I see like fees and charge policy review or development of an allocation policy, mowing and maintenance strategies, um, I look at these and I see, um, you know, maybe it would be hard on some of them to get all these organizations and groups together and have a conversation about fees and charges or um, develop, you know, an allocation policy for, you know, the ice times. Um, I get that that could probably be some difficult conversations, but um, I feel like having those groups and organizations involved in the answer makes things better and then they understand where they're coming from because if we just make them um you know it, it never seems to be right for anybody um because it, it's hard to please everybody so when i see this like forty five thousand dollars, i know it's already allocated and stuff but it, it's you know it's just a big number to me and you know when i look at like mowing and maintenance i, I think we have an a, amazing group of individuals that look after our parks and it's well done. So is it about like bringing somebody in and getting like more innovative ways to do it? Um, you know, so I, I question some of that, right? And then the Rotary Recreation Park Deve redevelopment, I understand that because we probably need some drawings done for that. But, um, you know, I don't know, you know, we've talked about there's some conversation around fees and charges for ice times, for example. And um, that we sit higher than other areas. Um, but I, I don't know, are we reviewing that to, to lower it because other communities are doing it? Because I don't know if I've heard or felt th um, that from council that we want it lowered or why are we changing things? So to spend $45,000 to have somebody bring us a report, um, you know, it's just, I, I had to want to ask the questions and just get some clarification, so. So first, through your worship, the policies are probably about $2,500 when we review them, the cost of those ones. They are not a, as a, a lot of money, but what happens is, is that we're bringing um, another group in. So, for example, when we did the first fees and charges in 2010, we brought PERC in, and we did a consulting thing, a consulting to figure out how we're going to do that policy, and the policy that we have right now is from that consultation with user groups, and that was the fees and charges. So that was 2010. We're in 2023. So we just really need direction of where we want to go, like um, what we're charging. So right now in, in that policy, we had five under five-year-olds. We're we provide free services for drop-in programs. At that point, uh, we were looking at seniors. Do we give free programming for seniors for drop-in at 55 plus or 65 plus? We decided, council decided not to. So what we need to do is sit back down and decide where we're going and what we want to do with the fees and charges because when we do the benchmarking, some of our fees are higher. It's not that we're going to be higher or lower. It's going to be council's decision of the direction that we go. But we have been questioned about the arena fees and as well as some of our programming fees at the pool because we are higher in there. So that policy is to Back, sit down with you guys, figure out where you guys want to go, sit down with the users. One of the areas that is brought up too is in the summertime, we made a decision in 2016 to charge the actual fee of what the fee is to rent summer ice for hockey or for figure skating. It was $379.99 an hour and the clubs aren't able to pay that. They aren't able to host the thing here, but that was a direction by council. So what we want to do is sit down, look at that, determine where the new council would like to go, where we're going. And so that's one of the things, the fees and policy, Fees and charges policy is very important to figure out where council would like to go and then from there working with the users. The second one is allocation. We have an ICE allocation policy. 
but we don't have an allocation policy for all other areas within our thing. What's the sport fields? What's the parks? What's that? So by using EDS Group um, to assist us, they understand best practices across Saskatchewan, BC, Alberta. They are looking at also the federal, the provincial, um, the regional, what those, what those best practices are. So they're going to assist us in making sure that we have the best allocation policy that we're able to have. It's going to take a bit of time to work with those groups. So those two are key. Then we start looking into the equity and inclusion. How, how do we, what do we want to do for that? How do we want to help those people? We have a leisure policy, so that, that again, we're going to use that information so with those policies. Majority of the money will be spent on the redevelopment of Rotary Park, which is really important to have that basis with what we're going to do. And then the last part is the state of recreation where we are in the, at the end of the year, where it's really important for us to, where do we hit the marks? What are we doing with this live document? Where do we need to go for the next time? So the basis of the next seven steps are like our foundation of our house, of our home, to be able to guide us as staff and also as council to determine where we're going. And it's not necessarily we able to do that. The mowing strategy works with, will work also with the naturalization to look at, do we need to cut as much grass as what we're cutting? Can we reduce that? That could save the city money. And how are we going to be able to be more for passive recreation for people in an open park with grass and things like that? So that's one reason why we think these next steps are the next part with the foundation, which we didn't use the $45,000, which was allocated for it. So that's why we feel that it's the next step, it's the foundation, it's going to give us the, stat, the basis to move <laughs> forward and decide where we need to go for the next five to ten years. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it clarifies it for and sure. And like for me, like I just want to do a shout out to for EDS. Like they have helped us with grants, sat down with us, charged us nothing. They've been here like all the way through and helped us with best practice and that kind of stuff. And they're here to help guide us and help assist us. The staff can do lots of things, but our capacity right now, we're we're at full capacity with our staff. So the assistance in that will help us a lot because our 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 department is very very busy. And then the last part is we're transitioning into a new GM. And so it's really important that we have that basis and that foundation and that we have this guiding through for the next six months because we don't want to be stagnant. I leave here at the end of this week and then we have a, they have to go through the process of trying to hire a new person and that kind of stuff and that we want to make sure that we continue on <laughs> ebbing and flowing with what we're doing. So that's why we put these steps in and to get going to make sure that recreation and we are moving forward with this living document, this, this master plan. Thank you. Yeah, no, that clarifies. And I was, and that's why I said at the beginning, there was no disrespect towards EDS or city staff. I realize um, how, what everybody plays in it. I just wanted to ask that question. I, I do too, actually. Just when you touched on the rotary, um, the Miles Zero Park redoing the, the playground down there. So I know that'll be a substantial part of this. But also I remember when they gave their, our presentation, their presentation to us, they said that they had somebody that was going to, you know, develop it. And I can't remember what their dollar value was, but I think it was around 10,000. They said they were looking mm -hmm. for to do that. So um, the plan is, is for us to, to take over doing that and then obviously work with them because they had a lot of ideas and they understand the property more than we do, I, I would assume. So so through your worship, they are they are guiding us. They're bringing the people together to the table to figure out what they would like to do. But it's 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 to decide what's going to be there. They know that they're putting money into a pump track. We know that we're we're assisting with the misting park as well as they know that we're doing um, a playground. So, but where are we going to put these? It's it, there's a floodplain there. Where is that important? So that's where EDS is going to sit down with them as a group, and I believe Councillor Parzal is going to be there, and they're going to review that to figure out what's the best practice, yeah. kind of where it goes, and then that document will have um, ideas where it goes, and there'll be some costing in there that will help guide Miles Zero Park Society, and if the city is going to be part of that, so that will be a document that we'll share between the Miles Zero Park Society and the city. The other one that's important is the event policy, um, tourism, what we want to do with that. That's another one of the seven that's within the seven next steps to figure out where council wants to go because sport tourism has changed um, once we changed what tourism was happening. So that's where the event tourism will work with, with, this, with Kevin and the general manager and council to figure out where we're going in tourism with that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Earl. Uh, thank you, Worship. Just kind of to... <coughs> <clears throat> to follow up on my last question, the reason I asked about is this kind of the final word on this particular document, and, and I, I want to preface this by saying overall I think this is a really well done document. I think it provides a, a great deal of information and, you know, for anybody, uh, be they council or staff or a member of the public who were to pick this up and read it, I think it would give them a very fulsome idea of where we are and where we can go. Uh, but there are some... Some phrases 
I, I, I'd rather not see in there. Um, and one example that stuck out to me, uh, page 32 of 144 under regional funding, and I'll just read the passage, and it's the last sentence of this passage that worries me. Peace River Agreement is a vital funding source utilized by the city for capital and operational spending. In May 2015, Dawson Creek and seven other meetings are going on and on. Last sentence, this funding allows the city to provide essential services associated with PRC while limiting increases in municipal taxes. Um, it has, in the past, allowed the city to provide those services while limiting increases in municipal taxes. And a big part of the reason... Um, the previous council I was a part of spent the last four years checking the couch for change um, is because we overindulged in this. Um, so when I see phrases like that in a guiding document, it gives me some hesitation in supporting it. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Parcel. Yes, just a few comments. So appreciate the mayor raising the issue of MOPS. I can tell you that uh, Mile Zero Park Society, uh, the feedback I've got is that they're delighted to be working with um, the city's rec department and EDS, and that will move forward uh, tonight. So everything's good there. That's good relationships, and uh, it's a dynamic partnership. So I'm looking forward to that gathering tonight. Um, you know, one of the, uh, I appreciate uh, Councillor Earl raising that, that issue. In some of my dealings with the general public, when they're comparing uh, things, uh, let's take an example, one that I think is uh, inoculated from in this report is the uh, golf course. And how much, uh, let's say, a neighboring community contributes to their golf course. And why can't we do the same? And you, you, I have to point out to them that it's, uh, they're talking about one of the richest uh, tax bases, communities in the province, and one which is uh, certainly not at that end of the table. And so general public, they're looking for things, they're looking at rates, but they're, they're, Every municipality has a different taxing capacity. So, you, you know, you look at ice rentals and Tumbler Ridge. It's an apples to oranges comparison. And um, we have to live... We've got big financial issues to deal with. And um, so that's why I appreciate what Councillor Earl said here. Now, just one thing that... Um, so this is a master recreation plan. It depends how you categorize it. Um... And again, I may have missed this, so I'm not saying it. But uh, one of the things that I do know is uh, coming, will be coming before council, probably, I'm looking at Kevin here, four or five years perhaps, but within the span of this 10-year uh, thing, uh, is uh, some of the facilities at the rodeo ground, a new grandstand. Um, and that's not touched upon in the in this total scope. Is that because that is not under the direct control of the city's recreation department? Because it's a big, big thing in the community, and I wonder why uh, that wasn't referenced. Thank you. Through your worship. So what happens is, is that the rec department, it is under the rec department, but we necessarily didn't ask for advice on that because we already have advice on that. So what happens is, is we guided in the, in the spring of 2022, we have a plan in place. We know that it's going to come up because we worked with Tryon. And so what happens is we need to look at that every year, that grandstand, that grandstand will get a stamp of approval at the point when it comes that that grandstand is, we need to do a new grandstand. We need need to have it in the next three years, we'll have identified that in our area already because we identified that this spring, that we're probably going to need a new one in five years. But what happens is, is we're continuing on the work that we did. The tw I can't remember how many, was it 40000 $40,000 that we put towards that to get it up to snuff to where it needed to be for the 100th anniversary. So what happens is, again, this spring, under the Parks and Facility Manager, she'll work with Tryon, they'll go do an evaluation on that, and then 
the following year and the following and the following year. So we'll know where that stands. And then Molina will be putting that through um, the five-year capital plan. I believe it's on the five-year capital plan already to, for the new grandstands. Are you good? <laughs> Thanks, you, Councillor Thank you, Parcel. Shante. I will miss you. Um, is there any other discussion? I will call this motion to vote. Vote is closed, and it's carried. Yippee <laughs> <laughs> um, Next is uh, 8.4. We have report number 23-041 from the Parks and Facility Manager uh, regarding the 2023 Ken Bork Aquatic Center operating recommendations. Anybody like to take a stab at him? Oh, Councillor Kemp. Thank you, Your Worship. I'll move the recommendation, the report number 23-041 uh, from the Parks and Facilities Manager regarding 2023 Ken Bork Aquatic Centre operating recommendations be received. For the staff be directed to continue with the implementation of increasing operation hours. For the staff be directed to continue with in-house um, training and future lifeguard instructor one and two. For the that staff be directed to move to a six-day operational schedule from May to August 2023. Thank you, Councillor Kemp. Do I have a second, Councillor Sudnick? Discussion? Councillor Kemp? Thank you, Your Worship. I'm just happy to see this. Um, I know um, previously I had brought it up, so um, I think increasing our staff um, and going to a six-day um, operation will be beneficial. Thank you. Uh, any other? Um, Councillor Earl? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And, and uh, I... Uh, associate myself with Councillor Kemp's comments. This is very welcome news. Uh, one question, and this goes back to the um, report we just voted on, is uh, many people in the public uh, note that they don't know about events, they don't know about stuff, and that's the reason they're not taking full advantage of the recreational amenities and, and programming we offer. How are we getting the word out to the public that the uh, pool is moving back to a six-day schedule so that people can, you know, certainly, um, I know we budgeted for a seven-day operation in the budget, but as you open it up, there's going to be real additional costs, and we want to make sure that it's being utilized to its full benefit, and there's not a six, eight, nine-month lag between when we open it up for another day and when people realize they've got six days. Through your worship, um, we will be advertising that through your communication plan. We have two Facebook pages. One is the pool and the other one is the recreation and then also the city. So we'll be advertising it through there as well as at the pool. One of the things through the master plan, it does state that we do... People don't know when our events are, but we we have a very active Facebook page, a very active website. Um, one of the things that we have not done is did the brochure. We used to send the brochure. It used to go to everybody's household, but it was... $15,000 a year um, to be able to do that. So we have decided not to do that. We have it electronic. So we will have that through the Facebook on site as well as advertising through there. Um, Anna Eichelberger is our marketing person. So she will be developing a strategy um, that will begin starting next week. Thank you, Shantae. Um, also, too, I just would. Uh, oh, Councillor McDonald. Sorry, Shantae, is it worthwhile? We have those community event uh, magnetic signs at the traffic circle in front of Tim's. Is it worthwhile using those as well to advertise? I know we advertise events at Oventive, stuff like that, but um, you would think worship. that would be an excellent pathway as yeah. well, right? So those signs are the signs that we use by the mall. So we, we have their own signs, so that will be used in the communication strategy as well. The other thing I just want to let you know too is that um, the staff is working with the school district 59 right now. We're hoping that February 2024 we may be able to have a lifeguarding program but we need to work with the principal of South Peace to make sure that's going to work. They could come back. There could be some financial um, things that the city may have to assist with but that will be what um, the department will be working on over the next two months to make sure that we try to get that on the timetable. But again, we have to work with the school to make sure that that lifeguarding will become an option within the school district. So it's just a conversation right now that we're working on. Thank you. 
Any other discussion? Uh, I just had a quick thing. I just wanted to comment. I just wanted to, you know, thank the city staff. I know um, uh, there's a lot of work that has went into this and a lot of outside the box thinking on how we get to getting back to a seven day um, a week. So this is definitely one step. I also wanted to, um, you know, a thank you out to the uh, community of Chetwin and Fort St. John as well and anybody else that's, you know, answered questions. And I know there's probably a lot more that I'm missing, but I know I was, um, you know, heard those conversations and part of them. So I just wanted to, you know, thank everybody and, and Shantae yourself and the whole team there on, on getting this more and, and looking, um, you know, like you said, with the school district as well for next year. It's uh, some exciting things to keep it going. So yeah. thank you. To your worship, the, the staff want to be back to a seven-day operation, but again, we have to have the foundation. We have to have the people that are there at any moment in time that if we lose staff, that six day can change. So we need to make sure that the staff that we have and we keep gaining staff. So the goal is that that's where we're going to and we keep on trying to find staff and training staff in house to keep that, that moving forward. Thank you. I know um, just one other thing. I know that the plan is to get it back to seven day a week. Is there, I know there's no um, way to, to know the future, but is that like a, do you think a fall plan or next spring plan or what, what's the, the reality of that? Um, Oh. To your worship, we're hoping that after shutdown, so shutdown happens the month of September for the yeah. pool. That's when we clean everything and go through all the filters in the entire building. We're hoping that September we can do a seven day moving okay. forward. So that's that's our goal. Target. Let's see how the six day works and make sure that every staff is through that. We're, part of this report was also in-house training, like Shantae mentioned, and to get the staff up there so we have more leaders on the deck that can run the show and uh, move forward. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilor McDonald. Yes, yeah, sir, you were just talking about training, et cetera, and I just had a, a community member reach out to me this past week questioning um, our bronze medallion courses we run locally here. And uh, just to, she was curious why ours is so much more expensive than Fort St. John and Grand Prairie and the timeline of ours where we run ours over a a four or five week session of one night a week and in Fort St. John they're offering it over a weekend kind of deal. Can you just comment on that for me? Do you want to do that? Shante, are you? Okay, Melina. Hi, through your worship. Um, so right now, the way it was scheduled, I think they were doing it for staff availability and to run it when there's nobody in the pool. However... We can run it, it'd be over two weekend. It's uh, about a 24 to 30 hour course, depending on the amount of students you have. So um, either two, like two, Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, and we certainly can run it over that part. During the summer we will have, because one of our ideas is to be closed on Saturdays in summer. I don't know if you noticed that Friday, May and June to accommodate SEALs. And then in the summer to accommodate lessons, we would run Monday to Friday, close Saturday, and then Sunday open for the public to have one weekend day. And that's to accommodate our lessons because during the summer we move, in which case we would run the bronze medallion, then cross, and then the lifeguarding program that follows right afterwards. Thank you. Um, Councilor Parslow. I'd like to get in on the action here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. This is a perennial question I'm asked, and my colleague here to my left uh, asked something he'd heard as well. Can you explain, because I can't give a good explanation in, in defense of the, of the pool, right, in this, in this one regard. I am fully equipped to defend the pool in all other areas. Why is the annual closure in September, not in, let's say, January? Your Worship. The reason why we closed the pool in September, we would have liked to have done it in the spring. However, this would interrupt SEALs in their practice and when they start up because they're a summer program, so they start up in the spring. So September, we need to have the doors open. January, we freeze. When we're draining the pool... To do maintenance on it, we run great big, same as you see on the rig, those great big green hoses. That's what we suck the water out of the pool in. And we need to leave the door open. We have somebody on staff 24 hours a day, so to make sure nobody comes into the building. 
and we drain the water. If we had the doors open in January when we hit very cold temperatures, we'd freeze everything. Simple question. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, if there's no more dis discussion, I will. Give me another question. I'm going to call the motion to vote. Vote is closed. It's carried. Uh, next, 8.5, we have report number 23-043 from the Chief Financial Officer regarding the Growing Communities Fund. Councillor Parslow. I'd like to move that report number 23-043 from the Chief Financial Officer. The Growing Communities Fund be received. Further, the council allocates $3,942,000 received from the Growing Communities Fund in 2023 to the general capital reserve in the 2023 five-year financial plan. Thank you, Councillor Parzal. Do I have a second? Councillor Kempf? So I Kevin, did you want to speak to this oh, before sorry. we get into it, or did you...? So three, Your Worship, um, first of all, obviously great news. Um, nice to get a little uh, gift from the province for $3.9 million. Um, staff brought this forward just uh, feeling that at this point, uh, you know, there's there's some options, but we felt it was prudent to to put it into the general capital reserve. It can certainly be taken out at, at a later date uh, if a project emerges or something on that front. We are anticipating to get further details from the province. Our understanding is that this is, as they said, no strings attached, um, but there will be some reporting requirements uh, that will come out of it and whatnot, but we believe it to be a fairly um, wide open uh, grant in a sense that it could be used for a, a number of things. It is focusing around growing communities. So, that, you know, they did talk about, uh, you know, infrastructure, amenities, you know, quite a number of options so um, but at this time like I said staff um, we know we've got uh, lots of priorities out there and and um, it'll come to it certainly be of good value for us into the future so thanks Kevin Councillor Apollonio oh, oh nothing actually Councillor Parslow just hit the first button first so <laughs> oh no I've done <laughs> Kevin just said exactly yeah. what I was going to yeah. say okay. That's why I asked him to speak. So you were good? You're good. Okay. Uh, Councillor Earl? Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, so, obviously, with my municipal hat on, uh, I'm, I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. mouth. Uh, very welcome contribution from the province, funded by a provincial surplus. Um, I do think, though, it um, highlights a larger structural issue that we have as um, different levels of government across the province. And I'm, I'm going to cite a, a fact that was highlighted by the mayor of Cranbrook recently, which was for every dollar of tax collected in Canada, 50% goes towards the federal government, 42 is collected by the provincial government, and 8 is collected by the municipal government. And that is contrasted with the notion that we're responsible as municipalities for about 50% of the infrastructure in the country. So while I appreciate uh, any aid we can get from the other levels of the government in funding our ever escalating and mounting obligations, um, the fact that, you know, uh, honestly, a, a direct per capita grant, no strings attached, is wonderful, as opposed to the existing status quo where we need to staff up with the grant writer and do umpteen reports and go with hat in hand to the province and to the federal government begging for funds so that we can fulfill our responsibilities on an ongoing basis. Um, I think, you know, a direct investment like this is, is a contrast to the status quo um, and, and it reveals how the degree to it, the degree of risk municipalities have and um, how dependent we are on the goodwill of the provincial government and the federal government in funding our obligations. So 
Um, glad for the money, but I do think among municipalities, there's a much larger com conversation that has to happen because um, one of the few things that keeps me up at night in this job is 20 years out, how we continue to fund um, our responsibilities. And when you look at that, that figure, 50% to the feds, 42% to the, the provincial government and our ability, you know, we get 8%. It, with all the whether it, protective services, infrastructure, recreation, cultural services, um, yeah, I don't know how how we maintain this over the long term. But for today, I'll, I'll take three point nine million dollars from the provincial government. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Any other discussion? I will call this motion to vote. I don't have a button yet, Joe. Oh, sorry. Now I will call this motion to vote. Vote is closed. That's carried. Uh, next, uh, we have nine bylaws, 9.1. We have report number 23-038 from the corporate officer regarding the Nowakin Friendship Center road closure bylaw number 4515, uh, 2022 for reconsideration of adoption. Councilor McDonald. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to move the report number 23-038 from the corporate officer regarding road closure bylaw number 4515 be received. Further, that highway closure and dedication removal bylaw number 4515 2022 be reconsidered and adopted. Thank you. Do have a second? Councilor Kemp, any discussion? I will call this motion to vote. Uh, and the vote is closed. It's carried. Um, next order of business is uh, 10 mayor's business. So 10.1 mayor's update. I'm um, of a bit here, so I'll go through it. Uh, first off, I uh, just wanted to um, spend a few minutes just recognizing um, the fallen firefighters memorial. Uh, Kevin and myself um, last week, I think it was March 6th. Um, went over to the fire department, but uh, I'll just read a little bit of a summary that uh, was sent to me by um, by uh, uh, Todd Piff Todd Pickett. But um, so on Monday, March sixth, the British Columbia Professional Firefighters Association Association held the sixth biannual BC Fallen Firefighters Memorial on the south lawn of the BC Legislation in Victoria. Mm -hmm. Among those honored in this memorial was Captain Hines Hess, who served as a member of the Dawson Creek Fire Department for many years. Hines began his career in 1982 with the Transport Canada Firefighters at the Dawson Creek Airport. In 1995, he transferred to the City of Dawson Creek Fire Department until he retired on June 21st, 2012. Unfortunately, a short time into retirement, Hines began his battle with cancer. And on August 10th, 2021, he passed away at the age of 66. Hines, along with 47 other BC professional fire, firefighters who have made the ultimate sacrifice, were honored on Monday. Hines' passing is considered in the line of duty as he and many other fallen firefighters fought a battle with cancer. The list of presumptive cancers associated with the occupation is long. The Dawson Creek Firefighters Union Local 2136 sent three members to Victoria to attend the memorial alongside Hines' family. Current and past employees of the Dawson Creek Fire Department gathered at the fire station Monday to watch the live streamed memorial to recognize Hines and the other fallen BC professional firefighters. Captain Hess had an upbeat and positive attitude and a heart of gold. He is missed by family, friends, and everyone past and present um, of the Dawson Creek Fire Department and the city as well. Um, so I, you know, I just wanted to, you know, this is from Kevin and myself and, and I'm sure everybody that's sitting here, just a huge thank you to all those that, you know, put their lives on the line every day and, you know, really the ultimate sacrifice, like it said in here. Um, yeah, we got, uh, there was a, a lot that attended, um, you know, obviously in Victoria, but also next door at the, at the fire department in recognition. This is the first time that a Dawson Creek firefighter has been recognized, um, in the sixth annual. So, um, yeah, I just, uh, you know, really wanted to, to, to give a big thank you to those, um, you know, and all those services that, uh, you know, help support and do that, you know, those hard, uh, hard careers. And, you know, I was talking a little bit too um, with one of the firefighters about this and, um, you know, that's where technology has changed and they realize now today, like, you know, the things that used to be done and, you know, 
earlier on that you know created some of these um, you know cancers that you know in, in this case didn't turn out good at all um, but they now have all the procedures in place to you know to help with this moving forward and, and prevent it so and they're always learning and always um, moving forward so yeah I just wanted to, to take time to, to recognize you know Heinz and uh, you know and all the, the services in our community that uh, that are out there for us so thank you um, Next, the loc I had uh, last Tuesday, I think it was, I had a tour of the locum housing. Um, so that is the uh, one property that um, the South Peace Health Service Society has taken over for the locums. Um, so I got a tour of that. That's the first time I've been inside it, and they've done an amazing job. Like it's a it, um, one, the property is an amazing property for locums that are coming, but um, just the whole um, feeling of the house inside too. And uh, I know a lot of that. Um, you know, Councillor Sudnick is involved in the South Peace Health Society, but I, I know there's a lot of volunteer that goes into that, um, from the decorating of it to the maintenance to all of it. And, um, you know, it's just amazing to see and um, great to hear that those physicians that are coming to town are asking to stay there. Um, so they've also asked about adding another bedroom. So they're currently looking at how they could add another bedroom into the house. Um, so just, you know, I want to give an update on that and, you know, and a huge thank you to the South Peace Health Society for taking that on. Um, as well, leading into that, the Ball Trace House uh, had their grand opening on Thursday. Um, I got a tour of that a bit before on Tuesday as well. So uh, it was just amazing to see the facility, um, you know, and just envision those families that are going to be able to use that house that, you know, are away from home and come to our community. And, um, you know, it's such an amazing facility. If you haven't seen it, you should, I really suggest going to get a tour of it. Um, they've done an amazing job. I, I've spent some time in the Ronald McDonald House um, in Vancouver before, and, you know, it's the same kind of thing. It's there for families that are, you know, in Dawson Creek from out of town, um, you know, whether it be Fort Nelson, Tumber Ridge, Chetwin, uh, wherever it is, to have that facility for them where, um, you know, they can still be a family and still have some comfort while they're away and you know definitely usually not going through good times when you're when you're um dealing with the hospital system so um yeah so i just wanted to you know a, a huge thank you to the whole community for that um and also to dr baltrace and his family um i knew them knew him well and i knew his wife well um uh, she's moved but not here he passed away uh but there you know it, it's just to to have that facility in honor of them, it's an amazing thing for, for them and our community. Um, and a big shout out to the Society for Community Living. They're taking over the operations of that project moving forward. Um, and also to the South Peace Health Society. And I, there's a, a long list of, um, you know, contributors that have helped get it to there. So I just wanted to um, give an update on that and thank you. Uh, for the BC Oil and Gas Commission, um, they've changed their name to the BC Energy Regulator. Um, we just had a bit of a Zoom call. It goes a couple of weeks ago now, Kevin and myself. It's kind of all a blur when we have these have meetings because it seems like we have a lot. But uh, just kind of an update on um, their name change and that they're, you know, the purpose of uh, the BC Energy Regulator and why they're here. And um, just that was kind of more of an introductory. Um, next, Enbridge meeting. We had a, uh, a meeting with Enbridge uh, last week. So um, just an update on their projects, who they are as a company. Um, you know, there's lots of great things for our area um, in that industry that are growing and moving forward. So, um, you know, when I say area, because it's not all directly Dawson Creek. It's, a, you know, the Peace Country region. So uh, it was nice, to, you know, to build that relationship and, um, you know, see and hear where they're, what they're working on. So... Um, also as well, we had a meeting with the Junior Soccer Association. Um, that was a couple weeks ago too, I think. Uh, just, they're having some struggles um, just moving forward. Um, so they just kind of brought that up to our attention where their struggles were at. Um, but it looks like it's moving forward, but it was just great to have some dialogue and you know realize that we're in it together. Uh, it was myself, Shante, um, Kevin, and I can't remember if there's more, but um, yeah, it was just good. We, you know, we're all, all want the same thing and, you know, their, their board has had some troubles. So it was just uh, good to hear that out. And I, I know Shantae and the team has been helping them and guiding them along where, uh, where we could. So it looks like there will be soccer, um, as, you know, as the last update, which is super exciting because there was a point where they were actually not sure if they were going to be able to continue. Um, so they were, they were asking, you know, for some help. So it looks like that's moving forward. 
Okay, and a shout out to Engage Sport because they're going to look after the registration uh, this year to help them to get you know get back up and running. So, um, and a, and a thank you to the, their board and you know uh, past and present that have you know been there for for good reasons and helping to get it there. So. Um, next, I had uh, this mayor's project number two with uh, Jessica Kimball. So, um, I, you know, I, it is such an amazing thing to be able to go out and, and meet these different businesses. And before I get into it, I, I know I've said this before, but uh, Jessica does this on her own time and just wants to showcase local businesses. Um, and it is truly like, um, for me, that's what it's all about. It's just about, she just does it all for the right reasons. She wants to... Um, get out there. She wants to showcase these local, you know, not always businesses, but local individuals and, and, and show off really what they're about. So, um, I, you know, I just wanted to really give a shout out to her. But um, we had f six different places that we went to in a hour and a bit span. So it's busy, but it's uh, it's good. I get to, um, you know, get out and socialize with, you know, business owners that I know and also get to meet new ones. So it's amazing. But uh, we started off at, with Dawson Creek Remax. So um, majority of the realtors were there. I think there was probably 10 or 12 people there. Um, got to, you know, talk to them, you know, see how things were going. Um, you know, it was an amazing time. And it, like so many organizations in our community and businesses, Dawson Creek Remax uh, gives back so much more than um, than is expected. They're always sponsoring events. They're always doing things. Um, and it's not always about recognition. They're just really trying to make Dawson Creek a better place and for youth. So um, it was a great start, you know, and a huge thank you to, um, you know, all the realtors and all the staff there uh, and the owners um, as well. So, um as well, uh, then we went to Rip's Cleat, Rip Cleats. So uh, what an amazing story um, that is. Uh, I've known Frank for a, a while and heard, you know, the story about how we started making these cleats and, and has grown it. And, uh, um, but, I, you know, then I go there and I won't give him too much credit because you go there and you see Corey, who's the manager and their team, like, uh, they're an amazing group of people and so detailed and organized. And they got like a, a pretty impressive factory going there on from how it comes in to going out, how they involve the community. Um, they only uh, support local businesses. So wherever they can, everything is done local. Um, it, it's, you know, and they're completely open for tours. So I know Councillor Earl has been there. Um, if Or maybe if he hasn't, I... Um, there was an invite for for all to go, but um, but yeah, I would recommend uh, taking the time and going there. Um, Corey, you know, and the team, it was just amazing to see um, and just hear the story. And I don't know, I get all excited when I see systems and passion all in one place because it's just uh, it, you know it was an amazing thing. Um, as well, I then went to Booster Juice and Chop Leaf um, to meet with Robin and Amber. Um, Amber was filling, filling in for, um, she's a marketing assistant at co-op, Robin's manager. Um, and then Rod is the you know, general manager at co-op. So, you know, just another, um, you know, I know I got to do the co-op last time, but it's, uh, it, it's so amazing to see all their different departments and how much they do for our community. Um, and, you know, their members, um, you know, I know that's their main purpose, but they really are about just... Um, growing and being innovative and doing what's best for Dawson Creek. And, um, I, you know, it's just exciting to hear them talk and their passion behind things. Um, and also excited to, uh, you know, just hear a little bit of their vision and what they they got going moving forward. So, um, they're, you know, as always, they're, they're always changing and innovative. And uh, in the last, you know, since I've lived here my whole life, I've seen the co-op change a lot, but they've done a lot to keep up with the times and, and have done a lot and they got a lot more coming. So, so that was good. Um, then went to the Dawson mall, met with Jillian. Uh, I was the manager there. I actually went to school with her. So it was, um, you know, neat to, to, you know, get affiliated with her and what they do down there. We got a tour of, of the mall and what their plans are and visions are for down there. Um, I know they had some unfortunate circumstances there last week. So it, you know, sorry to hear that, but, um, you know, she's very positive. They got a lot of neat ideas and also um, things that they're looking at doing moving forward. And, uh, yeah, it, it was great to be there as well. Um, and then uh, we went to the Dawson Creek Mixed Martial Arts Association. Uh, Jessica, um, who I, I've never met officially before, but um, it's downstairs actually in the Silverado Inn. So I, I was a bit surprised when I was 
down there because I wasn't uh, years ago when I was a kid. My uh, um, I, I was I've been in the basement and there was a restaurant there at one point and it was a bit different. But when I walked in there, I was just blown away at the facility they had down there. Like it's pretty much all done with the local um, martial arts association and what it's just an amazing area. They have uh, competitions down there. It, they've housed, I think, up to a couple hundred people, she said. Um, but her vision behind it was in 2014 as she was you know, into mixed martial arts and competing and didn't have a facility. So she wanted to create something here, and um, it's now blossomed into like a full community down there. And I, I can't remember what she said for members, but I think they have a couple hundred members. And uh, when they bring events here, they got like a ring set up down there and training. Um, you know, there was a, some very prominent uh, members of our community that were down there actually when I was uh, training and they wanted to throw me around a little bit, but I uh, <laughs> wasn't dressed for it. So, um, but no, I just wanted to, uh, it, those are just the little things that I didn't get to see in this community that how much they give back and, um, and help you know, at levels that we don't see with youth and, you know, all levels really. So uh, I was extremely impressed with Jessica. And I know too, if anybody would want to, you know, get a tour or go see it, she was, uh, uh, she would love to have you down there. So um, it was just an amazing facility and just blew me away that what was down there. So, yeah, so that was all for that project. And I think we have our third one scheduled. We're going to try and do one a month with uh, Jessica. Uh, next, I um, had a meeting with Raj Singh, uh, who is one of the owners from the Staybridge Suites. So um, it was more just an introductory. Um, he reached out to see if I was here one day, and then I went for coffee with him. I uh, got to meet him. I, you know, I don't want to give too much away, like uh, what their vision is, but um, the Staybridge Suites is, you know, it's been a long process. Uh, they had some difficult times, uh, you know, through COVID. They had a lot to come to surpass, but they're getting close to the finish line. Um, and it also is uh, uh, their hotel. They, they've invited us when they get closer to opening to come get a tour if we would like. They're going to invite us. Um, but it is more of um, their hotel and suites is more, it, it's more, well, it is all suites. So it's all kitchenettes, more about the long-term, um, you know, stays. Um, not that they're not for short-term visits, but it, it's more that long-term, you know, kitchenettes, bedroom um, style hotel so so yeah it was nice to meet him um next uh th this isn't really city related i was at way at a tumbler ridge hockey tournament for our child um a couple weekends ago and i just wanted to give a shout out to the tumb to tumbler ridge in the city of tumbler ridge just uh it, it was a you know a great event um tumbler ridge you know to me is it's a great community it's got a lot to offer uh but their you know team and um staff just put on a very you know, and volunteers put on a, a really great tournament and uh, the whole, there was a couple of Dawson Creek teams there for the weekend, you know, amongst other communities that were there as well. So just wanted to give a shout out to them. Um, also, um, uh, we, we did talk already about um, the growing communities fund. I did get a um, call from Minister Cullen um, when they announced this. Uh, so shortly after he called me, just letting us know that the amount that the city was getting, um, you know, and yeah, had a pretty good conversation with him. Um, you know, they've they said that the funding is going to come to us. It's uh, you know won't be attached to any grants or anything. It's coming to us that we can use that funds however we want within the parameters, um, but also that it can be used to double up on grants and other other sorts of funding so it's uh, it's not meant to be used on its own so we can take that 3.9 million and you know if there's other grants out there whatever we decide to do with it um in those guidelines uh, you know we could potentially turn that 3.9 million into more five or six million if we we find the right grants so uh, so i had a really good conversation with um with him he was at a smithers i believe so um yeah so that was good just give an update on that um, I didn't have this on my list because I just wanted to give a you know a quick shout out to um, Dawson Creek Kodiaks who uh, you know ended their season last week so they got a, their year end final event coming up this Saturday so I just wanted to you know congratulate the team on you know how they did this year um, you know and thank them for what they do for our economy in town as well um, and also to the Dawson Creek Canucks, they um, made it past Spirit River and are now in the finals. I think they had their first game on Saturday. 
And I haven't been able to uh, get down to watch a game yet uh, just because of the hours of it and, you know, having a family, it's tough to get away that late. But um, I know from from them and people that have been there that the the arena has been jam-packed, um, which is amazing to see in Dawson Creek. So um, just a thank you to all those fans and, you know, the team. I, I know it wasn't that long ago that the Dawson Creek Canucks were debating whether to even continue going. So I know at that point a lot of um, the players and some local businesses and, you know, people got together to, to help it go. So it's amazing to see it go from that to, to this. And, you know, when I was a child watching them, it was like that. The arena is always packed. So just a great thing to see. Um, another thing, too, I just wanted to quickly run by. There might be some more dialogue going out. But um, I see all these um, posts and stuff to recognize, you know, whether it's youth and sports or it's, you know, the Special Olympics that, um, you know, we're going on. Um, I'd like to look at ways to recognize them. And I know we have some certificate of appreciations that we've done up in the past. So I just wanted to throw this out to council. Um, you know, as we see things come up, uh, if you would like, you could... Um, you know, email myself or Fiona or we can discuss, but I, I would like to go out and, you know, recognize, you know, not always just youth and sports, but if there's somebody like an act of kindness we've seen from a, you know, a child or somebody like we want to recognize, I, I'd like to get to some point where we go out and recognize um, these individuals. And I know we've done up certificates of appreciations before and had people come into council chambers, you know, at meetings and recognized, but I realize that's probably hard for some in school. So, just wanted to put some thought around it that I'm something I'm working on that, you know, if we can do that, like I wouldn't mind, you know, myself and council or one or two or three of us or just council going to those schools if we're doing that and, you know, recognizing them in their classrooms for, you know, for, for what they've done. So, um, but yeah, just wanted to throw that out there. There's so much going on. So it's, um, it's, it's hard to recognize and not miss. So um, more eyes will make it better. So. Um, that was all I had for updates. Um, next, 10.2, we had the delegation request from Macwood Productions. So uh, there was an ask there that they um, were asking up to $7,000 to help fund their the production. So um, there is an ask. So if somebody wanted to put a motion forward um, on how we respond. Oh, Kevin, did you... Yeah, so Your Worship, there were a few questions or comments just around the community charter and assistance to business. So just uh, just for clarity, um, there is a pro prohibition against assistance to business in the community charter. And just uh, a quick blurb out of that, a council must not provide a grant, benefit, advantage, or other form of assistance to a business. Okay. Paraphrasing, but that's... Um, there are some exceptions, and I've read through that. Um, it doesn't appear that um, this would fall within one of those ex uh, exceptions. So um, it appears on its face that um, if, if you were to provide a grant, which this would essentially be uh, to a, to a for-profit, which they are, it appears, um, it would be prohibited. Okay. So then just a motion that we can't... I guess the other part too, I just um, just so every all council's aware um, and for new council, just I think our grant budget's around eleven thousand dollars a year. So just when we are facing these things throughout the year that that's there's not a large amount that's in the grant. And, and line. your worship, you, you could just receive the presentation as for information. No, I was given that more as an update. Just okay. so they, yeah. Oh sorry, we can just receive Yeah, I think as presented and just leave it at that. Okay. Councillor Parcel. Yeah, so <clears throat> I recognize the limit, the, 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 I'm going to call it prohibition, right? But I'd like to focus really more on the, on the uh, spirit of their presentation. Um, it, it just highlights, um, in the days of Mel Floellen, who used to run the college Meryl. program, um, the wonderful choir and, and so on, um, and with the when we formed the first youth enterprise center in Canada here in Dawson Creek, um, he made a presentation about how many young people from this community now at that, and I'm talking 1987, 88, how many young people from this community 
uh, their main source of income and, and work was through the arts. And at that time, it was around about 100 people that he identified. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, through economic development, um, if there's a way of encouraging, uh, aiding in the formation of uh, entrepreneurial enterprises associated to the arts and culture. Um, and I'm thinking that one way might be that one can dialogue with the South Peace Arts Council, who used to be a recipient of a grant, but in budget cutting it was cut, low-hanging fruit and, and so on, um, about that. Because I know um, in Fort St. John, the city of Fort St. John supports the Fort St. John's Art Council with a grant, and they use that grant to support various um, not-for-profit groups, okay? But what would be prohibiting in having a fund managed by the South Peace Arts Council with the intention of supporting local entrepreneurial enterprises? Um, it's at arm's length. Okay? Um, it's what I like about it is it's local people who uh, want to pursue their passions and talents locally, right? And um, I'd like to think there's a way the city can can support that. So I'm just offering some reflections, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. But, but anyway, I, uh, regretfully, I would move the motion that we receive this for information. Okay. Do I have a second? Councillor Sudnick. Councillor McDonald. I would just like to suggest. I guess, sorry, before you go, just because this was received for information, we can just have some discussion around why it was received for information. We can't talk about it. Should I get some clarity? Um, have we got a mover and seconder for yeah. that motion? Councillor Parslow and Councillor Sudnick. Sorry, Sudnik. I was taking notes there. Um, but yeah, once we've received for information, then the conversation is on that matter is done, unless you want to make any kind of amendment if you wanted to add something. Yeah, so sorry. So the comments can only be around it being received for information. It can't be about anything else. Yep. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, just I would just amend our motion to say that we advise staff to send them a letter of appreciation of their presentation and explain to them within our bylaws why we are prohibited to invest in their business and that we wish them all the best in their, their future endeavors, just out of respect. Can we get a seconder for that, please? Councillor Sudnick. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Don. Sorry for cutting you off. I nope. just wanted to clarify. No, that's right. So, okay. Um, all right, so I will call the vote on the amendment. Vote is closed. That's carried. So now I will call the... Oh. Can I just make a side comment? Yes. This is, this is a classic example, right? where I met with yourself and Brenda about consensus agreement, because I would willingly have accepted the amendment, and by consensus we could just deal with this all one, one quick move. But that's just using this as an opportunity time to illustrate how okay. that be. We deformalize the amendment process, but let, let's continue now. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor Parzal. Um, all right, if there's no other discussion, I will Call the motion to vote as amended. I will call that to vote. Uh, the vote is closed. It's carried. Um, 
Next order of business is uh, 11 uh, CAO's operational update. Kevin. Thank you, Three Worship. Um, just one quick update is I want to take the opportunity and recognize that this is Shante's last meeting. So she's got some Kleenex over there, I see. Um, so 32 years at the organization. Um, this is her last meeting and her last week of work. I want to take the, uh, the time to, to say thank you. Um, I've been here for 27 of those 32 years and, and um, consider Shante a friend, not just a coworker. Um, there's nobody in the organization that uh, cares more about the organization or its people than, than Shante. Um, she always uh, would go the extra mile for, uh, for anybody and uh, it, it didn't go unnoticed. So uh, it's a huge, huge void that we're gonna, we're gonna see here. And, um, but saying that I do wish her the best because I know uh, it may not look like it at the moment, but I think she is excited and happy about this opportunity. So, um, so I know that that is um, that's going to rejuvenate her, and uh, taking on new opportunities is always exciting. So, and we will be working closely with her, uh, I'm sure, as uh, she moves into this new role. So, again, uh, from me personally, thank you, Shante, for everything you've done for me and for the organization, your staff, your people, and even not your people. Um, just the people of the organization. So, um, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> thank you, Kevin. Um, I'd also like to add to that now. So I just, um, uh, from myself, Shante, and everybody that's sitting on, on this side, we just want to, you know, thank you for all that you've done for our community. Um, and I know you do a lot more than uh, just what you've done, you know, in your position with the city of Dawson Creek. I think about 30 years ago, so must have been when you were just starting out, I was my first introductory to yourself and um, youth committee groups that you held and put together. And those, um, you know, helped me a lot when I was, you know, at a, at a crossroad in my youth where I didn't know which way I was going. And um, that was one of those things that, you know, helped me in the right direction. So, um, you know, it's funny how things happen in your life and cross and pass. And, I, you know, I strongly believe it all happens for a reason. So... Um, yeah, I just really want to thank you for everything uh, for me personally and from council. And, you know, obviously, um, I know this relationship and what you do for Dawson Creek is not over just because you're, you know, your career's going in a different direction, but I'm excited for you and um, the new opportunity and, um, you know, the change for you. And, you know, I know you'll do great at it and I know we'll still be seeing you a lot. So thank you. So. I got myself together so I can just do a reply. <laughs> so as I was coming up the stairs today, thinking, I've been with eight mayors, 11 council cycles, six CAOs, five CFOs, and five managers. And it's been an amazing opportunity to work for the city of Dawson Creek. There's nothing better than to work with an organization that you're proud of each and every day. And I'm no different than every single person that works here. Every people, all the people that you have here, they love to work for the city of Dawson Creek. They're proud. Our people are our greatest asset. Never forget that. And sometimes the city does look frowned upon us sometimes with what they do, but every single person that works for the city of Dawson Creek, I know, comes to work to do a good job, and they're very proud to work for us. They're very proud to work for you as council. They're very proud to work for us as senior management. So thank you. It's been a great opportunity, and I'll be thankful for everything. I was 25 when I started, single woman. Now I'm leaving as a wife and a grandma and a mother, so it's been an amazing thing that has happened. I've had many highs and many lows. So thank you very much. And I will be always working with the city of Dawson Creek some way, somewhere. Thank you, Shante. Um, all right. Our next order of business is the diary. Anything in the diary? I don't think there's nothing in the diary. Uh, next, consent calendar. Get a motion to accept the consent calendar. Councillor Kempf, second. Councillor McDonald. Um, I'll call that to vote. We're waiting on two. One. <laughs> Everybody voted down there? We're waiting on one. 
Okay, vote is closed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, was there anything that needed to be lifted from the consent? Is there anything that needed to be lifted from the consent? No. All right, next uh, 14, 2022 strategic priorities. Um, we're very excited this week, Thursday and Friday. We have Brian coming in to do our strategic planning. So, um, you know, as time goes and we get that, uh, I'm excited, looking forward to these two days. I know Brian is and, uh, and everybody else. So it's a quick update on that. Media questions, there's no media here. Um, 16, uh, I just had a motion to recess to closed. Um, Councillor Kemp, second Councillor Sudnick. Um, and then I guess just before we recess to close, um, we're gonna do closed and then come back in for, we have a one committee the whole just a master plan, but we won't be um, on camera just because uh, we won't have the staff here for that. So just an update on that. And yeah, I will throw that out to vote. Oh, thanks. Vote is closed. <laughs> so we are going to close. I'll just start pushing the button. <laughs>